All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Shakiba. I'm the course TA for the course we are we're engaging with at the moment. Um, Decent Work and Economic Growth, Achieving SDG 8. So welcome to this or first the live Q&A session. I hope we're all excited um, to get started. We have with us today Mighty Chen and Mike Rogan, two of the lecturers on the course, um, both talking about informal work, both um, with videos uploaded, lecture videos uploaded on informal work. And today they've joined us to talk a bit more about their work, but also to field your questions um, and to engage with you on, you know, whatever you find interested from the course and questions that you might have as well. Um, so just a couple of things before we get started. Um, I'll start by asking Marty and Mike to introduce themselves and, and say a bit more about their work. But before we get to that, um, just want to say, we'll, we'll keep you muted just to um, reduce the chaos in the room. Um, also, if you do have questions to ask when we start fielding questions, please, please feel free to drop those questions in the chat. We'll pick those questions from the chat. Um, I might also ask you to unmute and ask your questions if you want to do so, um, but feel free to start putting questions in the chat um, just now if you already have questions. Um, all right, so we'll get started. I'll ask Marty and Mike to just introduce themselves to us, um, to say a bit more about themselves, to say a bit more about their work. And in their introductions, um, to just answer like two two questions for us. Um, both of them um are involved in research and and policy, um, with informal workers. So I'll ask them two questions. Um, the first being, what about informal work or informal workers drew you to research or policy in this area? And the second question being, what are some of the changes that you've seen in either the research space or the policy space um, over the years that you've been working in this field? Um, shall we start with you, Marty? Thank you so much, Shakiba, and thanks to all the students for being here. It's wonderful to see uh, so many names. Um, I'm Marty Chen, and um, I was a co-founder of the WeGo Network, which is known for its uh, work with informal workers, its expertise, but also its um, more action work, um, helping organizations and networks of informal workers advocate for a better deal. I also have taught at Harvard University for over 35 years. Um, and what drew me to the informal economy it's like an origin story. I grew up in India and India is a country where 90% of the workforce is informal. So I grew up with, you know, a laundryman, a milkman, a postman, a, all of these kinds of workers, a gardener, a cook, um, the maid called an Aya who worked with us. And uh, so I grew up with the informal economy and the first half of my career I was working in South Asia. I worked in Bangladesh for the 70s with this large NGO BRAC in charge of its women's program. And I was with Oxfam America field rep in India in the 80s. And again, worked with um, many nonprofits working with informal workers. And so what uh, drew, drew me into uh, founding of WeGo was that I then came after India to Harvard University and had this rude sort of welcome that my, I was at an institute of all economists that most of them thought the informal economy was comprised of those who were non-compliant, who were non-productive, that it was a messy concept. They had all these negatives and yet I knew it was where most of the working poor were. So I felt we needed to change the narratives. And I'm happy to say that there, I think there've been two big breakthroughs in addition to the fact that we have 10 million workers in the network uh, from 90 countries or more, is that 
the um, understanding of the informal economy has shifted. Early on, it was seen as small micro firms with plucky entrepreneurs and the informal wage workers and the contracted workers were not part of the definition. And that has changed. And then most recently uh, with the COVID crisis, it was the first time in my more than 25 years with WeGo that I wasn't being called by journalists because the informal economy was seen to offer a cushion to those who lost their jobs, mainly formal workers, but rather it was recognized that the informal workers themselves were the uh, disproportionately impacted by the COVID crisis. So I'll stop there and I turn it over to Mike Rogan. Please go Hi on. everyone, uh, lovely to see you all and, and thanks for coming to today's session and being part of the MOOC. Um, we've really enjoyed this and, and I hope you are as well. Um, I'm based in South Africa, uh, where I teach economics uh, at Rhodes University in the Department of Economics and Economic History. And for almost 15 years, uh, I've been a research associate uh, in the Urban Policy Program uh, of WeGo, uh, which, which Marty has um, uh, just uh, spoken about. Um, by training, I'm a development economist with a particular interest in labor. Uh, but I spent the first five years or so of my research career uh, looking at different ways of measuring things like uh, income poverty and, and inequality and trying to sort of get to grips with some of the, uh, the bigger picture trends around, around these two kind of key development indicators. But uh, it became increasingly uh, clear to me um, that if you want to understand what's going on with poverty and inequality, you have to understand uh, the employment situation and the source of earnings uh, for the vast majority of the, of the poor in the world. Uh, so it's quite difficult, I think, to understand uh, the possible solutions to or ways to approach things like, like poverty without understanding uh, the informal economy. I, I also come from a country, uh, South Africa, uh, despite the accent, uh, where we have something of, of a puzzle in relation to what we call the informal sector. Uh, we're one of the few, if not the only countries in the world to have such a high uh, level of open unemployment alongside a relatively small informal sector by comparison with our neighboring countries, for example. And some of the things we've learned about the informal sector in South Africa, I think, uh, are important lessons for other places, uh, namely that the, the informal sector is, is not a free entry sector or doesn't consist largely of entrepreneurs who can start up new jobs if they lose their jobs. As, as Marty said, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily a cushion um, for when, when times are tough in the formal sector. So we've learned some things in South Africa about how the informal sector relates to uh, its counterpart, the, the formal sector, and what those relationships might mean uh, for the type of work that's, that's possible in the, in the informal economy. Um, yeah, I mean, thinking about some, some changes in the, in the research and, and policy space, um, just building a little bit on what, what Marty said, I, I think one of the most important and exciting things in the research space uh, has been the way we're able to measure and understand um, the size and shape of the informal economy. Huge strides have been made, uh, and a lot of those uh, sort of improvements in our in our collection and measurement of, of concepts in the informal economy have come from WeGo itself. Um, and I'm not bragging because I wasn't involved with those. Marty was um, really pushing. Uh, the international conventions for measuring um, informal employment, so we can understand properly what we're we're talking about. Um, the COVID moment um, is still on our minds, and and in addition to the the attention that was given to the informal economy, this was a moment where we really understood the potential and importance of social protection, uh, and in particular in relation to the informal economy. If we're saying that 61% of, of workers in the world are informal, we are essentially saying 61% of, of workers globally uh, don't have social protection. So when something like COVID comes along, uh, there's no safety net. And when that happens, 
Uh, we tend to be at risk of losing, as it certainly seems we've done, uh, any of the progress we've made towards the things which we think are important, like the sustainable development goals. So understanding informality and informal employment uh, and the role of things like social protection has become increasingly important. And, and it was encouraging to see some, uh, some steps forward in that direction as a result of the, the COVID crisis. And, and I think our hope is that those, those realizations and those gains can be taken forward um, uh, and not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Marty. Um, very interesting work that both of you are doing. Um, I found particularly interesting, Mike, your module on um, informal work and COVID-19 and sort of the impacts on the informal sector. Um, just for informational purposes for, for um, the learners, Marty teaches on module two um, of the course was just opened on Monday and Mike teaches on module five so that will open in a few weeks. Um, my, Mike's module um, is about informal work and COVID-19, the impacts of, of COVID-19 on informal workers and sort of the lessons learned from that and of course Mike gives us an introduction to informal work in module two. Um, so we do want to open the floor to questions. So do feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll we'll pick those from the chat and also give you a chance to voice those questions um, as we see them. But while we wait for your questions, I have one question for you, um, uh, both of you, Mike and Marty. Um, one of the things, one of the videos we see in module two um, is Mike's interviews with the, the Bogato waste pickers, um, so the waste pickers in Colombia. Um, and one of the, the asks or suggestions from the waste pickers at the end of that video is that there be some protection from competition um, for them until they are able to form themselves into a cooperative so that there be competition for maybe 10, 20 years um, until they're able to form themselves into, into a cooperative. Um, but on the flip side of that, there is you know, a strand of literature that talks about protection for infant industries and you know is outrightly arguing against protection for infant industries and so this suggestion by the waste picker sounds like protection for infant industries and i just wonder um sort of what are your views um how do we reconcile those two things asking for protection versus you know literature um that argues against protection for these types of industries mike do you want to Take that one first. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I I think you could look at this uh, a couple of different ways. Um, one is to think of uh, groups of uh, informal workers who are organizing themselves into cooperatives as an infant industry, um, so not in competition with with infant industries. Uh, and probably, um, uh, depending on the context and the value chain, probably being in competition with large international um, corporations, um, both those who are in the recycling value chains themselves, but also the large international corporations uh, that actually make uh, the, the products that are, end up being uh, recycled as, as byproducts of their own goods. So think of tins, aluminum, plastics, uh, things like that. I think those are the big um, companies, both the recyclers and the producers of recyclable waste, uh, um, from whom uh, smaller companies and cooperatives, I would include in that, should be should be protected in in terms of competition. But I also don't think we need to see it necessarily as a, a zero sum game, right? Um, it doesn't have to be uh, either or. And I'm thinking of some creative solutions uh, with um, uh, producer responsibility uh, type arrangements. Uh, where, uh, for example, there are levies or contributions made by the producers of recyclable goods that can be handed down the value chain to sort of subsidize and contribute to the livelihoods uh, of workers and organizations that are collecting and doing the, the recycling. I, I think particularly in the waste sector, we have to remember that it's it's just not, not just an activity that, uh, that supports households and, and uh, um, allows people to, to earn a living, but it's also an environmental contribution. It's work that has value uh, in and of itself. So any creative approach we can take to involve those large companies 
not as competitors, um, uh, but allow them to, to sort of transfer um, uh, some of the, the gains and profits down the value chain to the small companies and, and groups of workers that actually recycle the, the goods that they've, um, they've sort of created as byproducts of their, uh, of their main products. Uh, so I, I think creativity and um, and thinking about it um, uh, in in a, bit, in a bit more nuanced way would would probably be the best way to think about that. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Mighty, any anything on that? I just would add, uh, since I know the Bogota, Colombia context uh, quite well, and it applies to most other countries as well, which is that for generations, the recycling of waste has been done by informal waste pickers. But when cities sit up and decide to modernize, they extend the solid waste management contracts to big companies, often transport companies that have never handled waste, but then are paid by the ton to collect and haul and dispose of the waste without much attention to the recycling strand of waste management. And so what has happened is the waste pickers who were left out with this sort of modernization um, trend have had to advocate uh, for many years. In the case of Bogota, it was 20 years of advocacy to win the right to bid for a solid waste management contract. And the city had given quite a bit of money, it was $1.3 billion to some big companies who were not recycling, they were just hauling and dumping. And the Waste Picker Association had to move from advocacy mode to enterprise mode. They had to suddenly be able to um, make a technical bid with all, the, all that's involved in bidding, and then to be able to deliver efficiency on uh, effectively, they had to develop an app for measurement. So what I think we need to think is that the, mo the model that's being talked about is the one that allows for more recycling in it, not just the, the collect, haul, and dispose. And the players are up against, like Mike said, really big players in, um, there was a French international company competing in in Colombia to buy up recycling companies. It's big money, the waste industry. And these groups um, have lobbied, advocated for 20 years to be part of the solid waste management. And now they're being crowded out after their moment of victory by fake cooperatives and associations of waste pickers. So I think partly because of the environmental benefit of the uh, waste picker associations being involved, and partly because of the very uneven power structure between the big companies and these small associations, that I think there is room to think about um, protection, if you want to call it that, or some kind of um, affirmative action in the bidding process for these groups. And we are also dealing with a complete mindset shift that was necessary for a city to recognize that the waste pickers were the original recyclers and the best recyclers. So I think for environmental and also for the power dynamics in the sector, it is important to give them that sort of window to be able to, to come up with an effective bid and to be able to deliver on the bid. And uh, that takes that takes some time. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and that context is 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 certainly valuable. Um, so we have a few questions popping up in the chat. I'll just take one of those. One of those is is sort of two questions in one. Um, and the, the question is, there seems to be a dichotomous view of formal versus informal sector. So from that, the first question is, should the informal sector be seen as a mirror of the formal sector um, or just a sector in its own right? And following on from that, 
um, we're talking a bit about social protections. What type of social protections should we be talking about or thinking about for informal sector workers? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give that to either of you who wants to take a go at that first. Um, I can take a go, and I know Mike will have some important uh, added value to add, but um, the formal versus informal is, is complicated because there are a lot of formal firms that hire workers informally. So there is informality in the formal, right? But it's not a mirror image because the informal is comprised uh, much more of self-employment, of the what Gary Fields would call the low-end self-employment with single person or family units. Um, so it can't be seen as a mirror image of each other. And in fact, what we need is for labor economists and others to recognize that labor markets in um, emerging and developing countries particularly don't reflect the notion of a formal um, labor market with largely uh, wage employment and unemployment. Um, the other is that they also should not be seen as dichotomous because they are linked. They're structurally linked in so many ways. Um, not all of informality, but most of informality is structurally linked to the formal economy. So they're producing goods and services that the formal firms, the formal economy wants. And they're often hired by or subcontracted by formal firms and platforms um, on informal terms, which means lack of any social protection contributions. So uh, what we're looking for in terms of social protection is a kind of universal social protection, but not premised on efficiency grounds, but on equity grounds, and which is financed in a with progressive kind of financing, not regressive. So some of the financing um, that's been proposed is quite can be quite regressive, um, especially if they take out any as some of leading economists has proposed, taking away subsidies for food and other things in, in, in the tax system. Um, so we are looking for universal, we're, but we're looking for it with progressive financing and as much as possible near equal benefits. Most of the universal systems right now have lower benefits, even if you pay the highest premium uh, for the informal workers, but over to Mike. Yeah, the uh, I think the only thing to to add to the the discussion of the formal informal dichotomy um, is that even the informal sector, where we have uh, self employment uh, uh, largely in particularly in developing countries, uh, own account work, which is where the self employed don't hire other people; they just work by themselves. There are lots of backwards and forward linkages between the formal sector and the and the informal sector. So it's very difficult to uh, distinguish them or say that they are in, in, in some way separate. Uh, many times the, the terms of engagement are dictated uh, by the formal sector uh, within the value chains in, in which they they uh, they both compete and, and operate. Uh, and many times the, the possibilities in the informal sector are determined largely by uh, some of the bigger players in the uh, in the formal sector. So it's very difficult, even with own account self-employment, to, to suggest that there's a separation between the, the formal and the informal, in addition to the points that, that Marty made, where there is lots of informality with, within the, the formal sector. Yeah, in, in terms of um, uh, social protection, um, we all know that this this discussion always uh, also differs quite a bit by by context, uh, by the structure of employment and by the uh, the structure of the existing social protection system. Um, interestingly, um, in the mainstream economics literature, there's been a concern that providing these types of universal social protections might actually encourage informality. Um, so we've been involved with some research. Uh, um, lately, which really seems to question this. And, and, and I think some of the evidence really points to the fact that 
Uh, social protection doesn't need to, or is unlikely to encourage uh, informality. Um, rather, it's it's probably a, a, a very key, and I think the COVID pandemic um, really demonstrated this, uh, a key feature of um, promoting productivity and raising earnings in the informal uh, economy. Right? It's the it's the gap or the lack of social protection, uh, which is which is the real problem. Uh, and certainly, uh, universal social protection is a huge part of the um, uh, the solution in in many 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 contexts. And and uh, uh, the, the problem that was exposed by COVID is, uh, in many contexts, including my own, we simply had no way of reaching um, those in the informal sector, whereas the sort of social protection architecture that would be required for a universal uh, program, whether it be health, uh, whether it be income supports, uh, whether it be for uh, retirement savings, uh, would have allowed us to respond in that situation so much more quickly and and I hope was a wake up call in, in many contexts where uh, informal workers are not a part of um, formal social protection. Thank you, thank you both. Um, and just following on that social protection question, there's, there's a really interesting question here on whether there might be some room for private insurance solutions to, to plug some of the protection gaps um, for informal workers. So that might involve informal workers paying affordable premiums um, and then having private insurance. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I mean, th there have been lots of different models and, and hybrid models uh, uh, sort of suggested. You know, I, I think the problem that we often have is the costs of private models are too high for for informal workers who are already forced in, in many contexts to um, decide how much food to buy and, and meet basic uh, household needs. Literally the definition of, of working poverty would would be the inability to uh, to sort of contribute. In some contexts, it's it's certainly possible. Um, one example that comes to mind is the national health insurance scheme in in Ghana, which I think is still held up as a um, uh, as a, a sort of flagship program for getting uh, relatively high quality health insurance or health coverage to to informal workers uh, or those outside the formal labor markets in in general. But the key thing about that is that uh, the contributions are very, very uh, low, right? Uh, almost, uh, almost anyone can can opt in based on based on the, the contributions. Perhaps more promise is when uh, the private and public, uh, or the private in particular, can be used to uh, cross subsidize uh, the public. And I think in the literature, the example that's held up the most is the is the mono tax in in Uruguay how you can uh, sort of use uh, profits and proceeds in the in the private formal um, in insurance uh, sector to cross subsidize the, the public sector. But as Marty says, the key thing and, and, and the thing which, which we hope people focus on is getting not just universal, but high quality uh, coverage um, to those outside of, uh, or those unable to access these, these sort, of, sort of private schemes. But where, where there have been examples um, of, Cross subsidization or or private public, I think there's been a strong um, tax component to that, uh, and uh, which has meant that there's been um, really subsidized contributions from uh, from those with very low earnings. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, and Mike, a question for you. Um, one of the things you talk about in your lectures is the the bad old deal for informal workers. Um, and in, in one of your lectures, you give street vendors in South Africa as an example um, of that bad old deal, sort of government, you know, removing their things um, from the street every now and then. Um, so there's, there's a question here on what might be a sustainable solution for street vendors in particular in their relationship with government. Um, and also some curiosity of whether Uyghur has done any work on this particular issue in Nepal. In Nepal, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, well, what the status quo in many cities vis-a-vis -vis street vendors is a lose-lose situation. And um, I will give the example from South Africa, although Mike is the one from South Africa. <laughs> in Durban, South Africa, in sort of on the edge of the central business district between that and the transport node, there was a natural market of street vendors that emerged once apartheid was lifted. And it's, you know, let's say 7,000 
vendors. Um, now, the lose-lose was that every once in a while, the city would sweep through at night and take the equipment and the pallets they used to store and sometimes even their stock, whatever they left um, in the vending site and confiscate it. And that cost the city a lot, but it really cost the vendors. Now the vendors were mainly from townships, which are at quite some distance and have no way to every day pack up their goods and their equipment and their the sort of and displays and take it home to the township and bring it back. So there's been a very innovative project in that setting for um, going on 20 years. Um, that has found solutions where you can rent common storage space near the market where the vendors can, they even proposed, you know, all those parking lots for cars, those, they're completely empty at night, right? In downtown Durban. But we, we think our mindsets are people need parking lots, right? We don't think street vendors need storage spots. So they've worked around it so it's more of a win-win and the market is flourishing because there's um, a whole traditional set of products that are sold to the black Afri South African population in particular that are delicacies or medicines or whatever that that population needs. So that's the mindset shift, which is that the street vendors are contributing. They're contributors to the city economy. They sell goods and services at convenient locations at reasonable prices. In the case of Durban, there's like 400,000 com commuters that come in from the townships and go and work in the central business district and go back. And they buy the goods they need during the day, maybe uh, their lunch, and they buy things uh, to take home to the townships. Uh, so they have to be seen as contributing and that there are the possibility of win-win solutions rather than these lose-lose solutions. But there was a second part of the question, which I've now forgotten, but... Oh, it's it's uh, whether Uyghur has done any work on, on street vendors or informal... Oh, in Nepal, in, in Nepal. Nepal. Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with our street vendor work in Nepal, but I am very familiar with our work with another category of informal workers in Nepal, which is home-based workers. And these are people who produce goods and services from in and around their own home. These are not domestic workers, these are home-based. Um, and Nepal has been at the center of the regional movement in South Asia for home-based workers. And the first regional conference of home-based workers was held in Kathmandu in 2000. Um, the headquarters of HomeNet South Asia, the regional association of uh, home-based workers is headquartered in, in Kathmandu. Um, and I'm sure that StreetNet International, the Federation of Street Vendor Organizations, probably has a partner in, in Kathmandu. I just don't happen to know it. It's hard to keep track. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, we have a couple of questions on formalization. Um, so just want to feel those. I see the hand up. I'll, I'll get to you in just a minute. Um, so th the first question on formalization is, is how can informal firms be assisted in the short run? Um, to be able to formalize in the long run. Um, and following on from that is in most developing countries with, with high unemployment rates, um, how should we assist or governments assist informal firms to formalize? Of course, both of those questions are on the premise that informal firms and workers should move into the formal sector. Um, so feel free to, to speak on that as well. Um, Marty, you look like you're ready to go. I'll take you first and then- um, and I'm sorry, Mike, but so I have yeah. taught a course on this at Harvard, which is the <laughs> informal economy is formalization, the answer, question mark. So very quickly, Formalization, traditionally, the mainstream mindset is two things. 
One is that you move people out of these informal activities into formal jobs, right? But that's not happening. We, we have 475 million unemployed in the world. We have 2 billion informal workers. We need to get employment for the unemployed and help those who've created their own work in the informal economy to get on with it. <laughs> so that, that, I mean, it's good to create more formal jobs, but it's just not happening on the scale. The second definition is that you register and tax the informal enterprises, right? The small firms. So there's, that has to be unpacked. One is that street, let's say a street vendor, cities around the world, maybe once in 15 years, decide to issue some licenses to street vendors, maybe to one fifth of the street vendors in that city, right? And then there's no way for a street vendor to register because they're not doing that. The second is, there is an assumption they don't pay taxes, but they do pay taxes and they want benefits for their taxes. And Mike can explain the results of a recent study in, in, in Ghana. So what should formalization mean? And we worked really hard with the ILO um, recommendation on formalization, which is that it should protect the livelihoods of the workers in the process. And it should mean several things. It should mean social protection. It should mean having a voice in policy dialogues. It should be having legal and rights. And it should mean economic opportunities, the four pillars of decent work. It shouldn't just mean what it has meant standardly. And then if those things begin to happen, the informal workers, um, well, operators are would be more happy to register and pay even more taxes they all do already. But the whole debate leaves out those who are wage employed informally, right? And there it's mainly formal firms and platforms that, right? So formalization should also turn the spotlight on the formal economy that contracts and hires workers informally. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Marty. Mike, anything from you on that? Yeah, um, you know, just to add to, to what Marty said, there are lots of debates about what we mean by formalization. Um, and, and many people tend to uh, sort of focus, as Marty says, on the punitive side, uh, register for tax, uh, register uh, with a local uh, authority. But a lot of that sort of relies on the assumption, which is that's how we define informality. Um, so as one example, um, we use the uh, internationally comparable ILO definition to, to survey uh, just under 3,000 informal operators in, in Accra, um, and we define them as informal based on the labor force survey and the, and the ILO definition if they were a small unincorporated um, uh, business activity. So in other words, they weren't registered as a, as a formal company. And we found very little evidence uh, of any informal workers that weren't uh, registered with some uh, level of government. Uh, roughly 40% were registered for uh, official tax with the, with the revenue authority. Uh, and almost all of the rest were registered um, uh, either with the local authority for the types of permits and operating licenses that, that Marty just uh, mentioned or were registered with numerous other uh, sort of official or um, sort of regulatory uh, bodies. And in fact, it was, it was hard to see ways that they, they weren't registered um, or on the books apart from uh, registered as a, as a formal company with the, with the Registrar General. The other thing we, we pick up, not just in that study in Accra, but in, in work research we've been doing for, for many years at, at WeGo and, and, and with other organizations interested and researchers interested in these, these issues, is that many informal workers, and just think about um, self-employed own account workers, the, the thing that always pops to mind is the street vendor, like the example that Marty just gave. Uh, it's it's interesting how often um, these types of workers uh, are in favor of regulation. Their very livelihoods depend on uh, well-organized and regulated uh, public spaces. It's the 
informal uh, implementation and enforcement of these regulations, which is which is the real thing that, that bothers them. But from their perspective, it's very difficult to see how they could be more regulated um, uh, or, in other words, comply more than they they already are. Um, it's it's what they're getting in return, which is which is often the the problem, and that's particularly the case in in terms of the of the types of taxes which are often levied against informal workers. They tend to be uh, too high compared to what they would be paying if they were um, registered as formal, for example, employees in a formal firm. And they tend to be highly regressive, meaning the types of taxes that, that we often ask informal workers to pay, a higher share of their earnings um, are paid by the lowest earners compared to the, the highest earners. So it's the type of sort of punitive approaches that, that regulation often imposes, not that they're unregulated. And I think what, one of the things we're often trying to say too is, well, what if we think about formalization as some of the benefits or the incentives that um, should come with it? Um, so for example, being able to write off uh, payments made to indirect taxes, um, the way their formal competitors are able to do, or what about protections uh, to work in their uh, place of work uh, when they've paid these licenses and, and operating fees? Um, what about access to uh, different types of social protection schemes, maybe contributory or, or maybe um, universal? What about the, the sort of uh, more beneficial aspects of formalization, whereas the debate tends to, to focus on the negative and tends to be built off on a myth that um, informal workers are, are largely evaders of such regulations, when the reality uh, that doesn't appear to be the case at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so we, we said we would run this session for half an hour. We've so far gone about 12 minutes over. Um, I think we'll go for another three or four minutes if, if that's OK with everyone. And we'll, that will allow us maybe two more questions. Um, so just we, we have a hand up at the moment. Sigaye, um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. If I didn't, please correct me. Please feel free to unmute and, and go ahead. And then I'll take one more question from the chat and, and we'll wrap it up. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, you pronounced it correctly. My name is Sagai from Ethiopia. Uh, thank you all uh, for having uh, this uh, opportunity. And uh, I'm one of your students who has registered for the, the course, but unfortunately I couldn't attend the last couple of days because of my personal problem. So I hope uh, I will continue to attend the remaining classes. So, uh, Actually, I'm from the areas of economics. Uh, I have a PhD in economics, and I uh, have studied a lot of uh, courses related with labor economics uh, and uh, gender. So uh, I'm uh, a bit familiar with the issue that is raised here. Uh, but I like it more to advance uh, my understanding of the issue. And uh, I was reading uh, the notes given there, so I enjoy a lot. I have some uh, questions here. First thing that uh, raised uh, is uh, in the informal economy, it's obvious that uh, the sector is characterized by no much protection and uh, absence of uh, job security and instability in the job, uh, especially in countries uh, like Ethiopia. There are a lot of uh, 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 labor force engaged in the, um, the informal sector and much of the uh, sector is dominated with such activities. My question is, uh, especially in terms of policies, uh, what types of specific uh, policy can be implemented for countries like uh, Ethiopia when there is uh, continuous uh, unrest, uh, uh, conflicts, and weak government, uh, especially uh, in most developing countries? And again, um, there are a lot of uh, uh, influences from the international uh, organizations uh, in the past, for example, the Ethiopia was removed from AGOA, uh, which was uh, a chance for developing African countries. Again, uh, millions of uh, unemployed labor uh, uh, are also um, dominating the market, especially new graduates from uh, different universities and colleges uh, can't be employed in the context of Ethiopia nowadays due to a lot of factors, including the government's capacity uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the level of our economy as a whole. So uh, can we suggest a policy that can solve uh, the employability of these new graduates from universities and colleges with uh, zero years of experience? Especially uh, experience is uh, one of the factors that affect uh, 
new graduates. So any policy that not your command is here is uh, uh, my question. So thank you. Thank you, Sigay. I'll, I'll just give Merti and Mike a chance to respond to that quickly, um, and then and then we wrap up. Mike, over to you. Uh, yeah, those are those are great questions, and I and I must say, uh, Ethiopia is not a context um, in which I'm particularly familiar. Um, and I think you're probably right that uh, uh, issues of conflict, in particular, um, sort of add an extra layer of of difficulty. Although weak governance is probably a more common problem uh, across developing countries with with large levels of informal employment. You know, I, I think it probably depends um, uh, quite a bit on the context and what exactly, which sector uh, of employment we're talking about in a conflict zone or, or, or a country with, uh, with, with weak governance. Um, but there are probably some principles that, um, that, would, uh, that would apply across different contexts with, uh, with different challenges. Uh, and I think uh, uh, access to uh, social protection um, ensuring that infrastructure, particularly in public spaces, um, uh, ensuring that uh, there's uh, the right to the city, as, as our friends in, in urban policy and, and planning often say. And to, to think about your, your urban spaces in particular, um, about uh, places that support informal employment rather than try to uh, sort of clean them up or brush them out the way. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of cities around the world, uh, whether they're conflict-ridden or uh, irrespective of their level of governance, uh, tend to buy into this idea of a, a world-class city, which you know I think ties directly to what what Marty mentioned earlier about the creation of lose-lose scenarios. They they tend to be catering for this uh, type of um, city that they envision, rather than the the city which reflects the the needs and wants of the people who, who live and work in them across, you know, particularly across the, the global South. So, you know, without getting into specific examples, I think there's some principles around uh, access to public spaces, investment in, in infrastructure in, in cities and access to social protection that, that any country could, uh, could focus on. And then perhaps there would be some more specific issues uh, around in, in Ethiopia that could, that could be addressed, but probably uh, difficult to get into it at this particular stage. Yeah, and you know the idea of, of graduates um, uh, unemployment and how, how to get uh, graduate skills, uh, again, I, I think that depends on, uh, on the particular uh, labor market in, in question. Um, in our neighboring country here in South Africa, um, Zimbabwe, uh, that is a, a significant issue. Um, uh, graduates from universities and technical vocational colleges uh, working in the in the informal sector, but I think some of the same things would apply in those particular contexts. You know, um, those are the situations where there are a lack of um, formal jobs in particular. So the strategy would would still be twofold: um, how to create formal jobs um, that match the skills uh, or match the skills that um, that are required by the economy, but also it's not a substitute for supporting uh, employment in the informal economy, right? As as Marty mentioned earlier, it's a two prong strategy. Think about how your skill system aligns with your uh, with your private sector or your formal uh, formal sector, but still the need to support uh, in what tend to be quite large informal economies in countries like Zimbabwe um, and, and Ghana. Um, whether or not uh, uh, the participants are, are from universities or, or vocational colleges, I think is a, is a slightly separate issue. Uh, but many of the things that we would do to support workers who created their own jobs in, in the informal economy, I think the, the policy advice would, uh, would be similar. Uh, Marty? Yes, I would just add that you know, in situations of conflict or even of weak government, where there's you know quest, there's lack of investment in the in the private corporate sector, I think the there are two broad kinds of policies towards the informal, and the one that comes to mind is the do no harm set, which is you know if there is conflict people are gonna to take to the informal economy to try to earn a living, to barter for 
things that they need with other people who are also suffering from the conflict. So in that context, if there could be do no harm, don't evict, don't confiscate goods, don't impose bribes, whatever it is from the government side, because your citizens are trying to earn an honest living in a very difficult situation. And then you can think about the more do some good part of things, which would be the social protection, the use of public space. But you have to assume um, that the informal economy is going to, especially in a conflict um, area, remain a very sizable share of your economy and also of your workforce. Um, so do no harm would be my closing uh, mantra at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty. Um, I was just going to ask, you know, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up here. Um, but sort of as, as a final word, you know, one thing you want the learners to take away um, from the course, specifically regarding to informal work and informal workers. Marty, for you, for you, that's that's do no harm. I'll give you another another chance just to <laughs> drop a sentence to the learners, the one thing you want them to take away. And then we'll take you, Mike, and, and we'll wrap it up there. Well, just to say, I can see from the names that we have many of the people here today, and I assume for the course as well, are from developing or emerging economies. And just to say the informal is so-called normal in your economies and the models that your finance ministers and your uh, labor ministers as well will be of a different kind of labor market where there's a lot of formal wage employment and unemployment. And the degree of self-employment in your labor markets um, is really something that you need to think about. And we need to change the mindsets that the informal um, are sort of negative, a problem. Uh, they really are part of the solution because they're the base of the economy, they're the base of the workforce, and we need this mindset, mindset shift to uh, embrace them rather than uh, penalize them. Thank you, Marty. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, to, I think, probably uh, quotes Marty Chen, uh, I think a key takeaway message is the informal economy in many countries is, is the real economy. Um, and as Marty says, we tend to look at it as some sort of residual or part of uh, the economy that we can't explain. And when we look at it that way, we can only see it as something which needs to be uh, removed or abolished or eradicated. Uh, and it's interesting how much policy advice leans in, in that direction. Um, but what we don't understand is that if we're serious about uh, development, if we're serious about reducing inequality, we need to support uh, the informal economy. If it makes up 61% of, of total employment, it's it's not something which uh, is in the shadows. It is the it is the main source of employment for the uh, for, for workers around the world, and particularly in the in the countries um, uh, where many of us on this on this Zoom call live. Uh, and until we understand uh, uh, that labor markets uh, with large informal economies are the norm, we're probably not going to see some of the, the more realistic and promising solutions um, that are right in front of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty and Mike. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us um, for this session. We have to wrap it up here, uh, but we've made a note of your questions and, and we'll talk some more about those on the discussion boards in the course. Um, we have another live Q&A session that will happen in a few weeks in November, and that one will be on structural transformation where another two of our lecturers um, will join us for that session. So look out for the details on that. Um, but for now, thank you so much to everybody who joined. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we'll see everybody again soon.